Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Welcome to the Chris Edges Report. Today we discuss the legacy of George Armstrong Custer and the vast disparity of the so-called Indian Wars with the author Nathaniel Philbrick. The playwright Eugene O'Neill said that one of the few events worth celebrating in American history took place on June 25, 1876, when Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, and Arapaho, led by Crazy Horse and Chief Gall, annihilated a unit of the 7th Cavalry under the command of Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. There are few battles in American history that have generated as much controversy or been as meticulously dissected and examined, and with good reason. The death of Custer and his command stunned the nation. It turned Custer, although he was criticized after the battle by his superiors for impulsiveness and lack of judgment, especially for splitting his force of some 600 soldiers into three battalions, into a martyr for the cause of Western expansion and imperialism. His death portrayed as the ultimate sacrifice for the nation that was at the time celebrating its centennial was used to justify a massive military campaign against Native Americans that would culminate in the massacre of some 300 Native Americans in 1890 at Wounded Knee. Many mowed down with Hotchkiss guns fired by the 7th Cavalry. The remnants of Native tribes were, after the battle, forcibly relocated to prisoner of war camps known later as reservations. There is a vast disparity between the mythic presentation of Custer and the reality of the so-called Indian Wars. Native Americans, including women, the elderly, and children were slaughtered. The U.S. government repeatedly violated formal treaties to seize land promised in perpetuity to Native Americans. The buffalo herds, which sustained nomadic tribes, were decimated by white hunters. Joining me to discuss this seminal moment in American history is Nathaniel Philbrick, author of The Last Stand, Sitting Bull Custer and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So I, I've told you before we went on that I, I love this book. Uh, I think it ranks with D. Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, uh, Evan Connell's great work, uh, Son of the Morning Star. I want to talk a little bit about Custer because he wasn't just a general. He was a celebrity. Uh, he had become a celebrity during the Civil War, one of the youngest generals, uh, appointed uh, generals of the volunteer forces when he was 23. He wrote his memoirs, uh, courted the press. Uh, but just before we go into what happened, tell us who Custer was. Yeah, who, well, cu who was Custer? Well, I think there's a, uh, a scene from his childhood that really speaks to what he would become. He was four years old. He had to get a tooth extracted. And uh, his father took him to the dentist. It was late at night. And uh, Custer at that point was terrified of blood. And his father said, you know, be a good soldier and we'll get through this. And Custer gets the tooth extracted, doesn't whimper at all. And he turns to his dad and he says, Pa, you and me can whip all the Democrats in Ohio. Uh, they were in New Rumley, Ohio. Uh, he grew up in a very highly politicized family. It was, you know, Democrats versus Whigs and uh, a clannish family. Practical jokes were really big. Uh, and, and, you know, it was, it was us against the world. Uh, he was last in his class, as you said, at West Point. But it was not because he was stupid. It was because he uh, wanted to play the game of being a, a bad boy and yet not flunk out. Uh, because many people did flunk out. He knew he was playing the, that, that hairy edge, a hairy edge he would play for the rest of his life. He would graduate, and that's the important word, graduate, last in his class, um, full of notoriety, beloved by uh, many of his um, classmates. And then he would stumble into the Civil War. 
uh, where he proved to be one of the great cavalry officers uh, in the Union Army. And we can't, it, he didn't fake it at this point. I mean, he really was good. He was outrageously brave uh, and uh, a good battlefield vision and judgment, a charismatic, uh, a little bit of a fop. Uh, once he became that uh, a uh, brevet general, he was free to dress as he wanted to. And so he had velvet uh, uh, uniform and long blonde hair, but he was good. And uh, it would be at the, the uh, uh, Gettysburg where he would actually turn back Jeb Stuart. And then the, um, the, the Civil War ends. Uh, he uh, and uh, Sheridan, who... Uh, Custer's right, he's a little bit like Forrest Gump. Uh, you know, when something's happening, he's there. He was there at Appomattox. Uh, General Sheridan ended up giving uh, Custer's wife, Libby, uh, who would be his press agent uh, throughout his life, uh, the, the table upon which the, the, the you know, the, the treaty had been signed. And, and, and then it would be off uh, to the West. But this was a very different kind of war uh, with uh, Native Americans. And he, he struggled and as did the military throughout. And yet he played it as well as he could politically uh, and in terms of the press and uh, kept that uh, reputation of being um, a risk taker. And so uh, ultimately it would all catch up with him at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But Custer was Custer almost from the beginning. Well, he was mentioned as a possible presidential candidate. Uh, he was widely known. He had celebrity status. I, I want to talk about two factors. A uh, huge influx of settlers coming into the West, which, uh, of course, uh, and they are seizing Native American land. Custer led the group into the Black Hills that discovered gold and set off a kind of gold rush. Uh, and the Civil War itself. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of these figures, Sheridan, Sherman, Custer, uh, most of them had come out of four years of fighting, but the fighting was different. Um, Sheridan, for instance, uh, ordered and Custard carried it out uh, at Washita and other places uh, that uh, Custer kill all military age males. Uh, Native American males were uh, captured. If they were captured, they were to be killed. It was a very, very brutal conflict, very different uh, from the Civil War, as brutal as that was. Uh, in, in many ways, this was a war about extermination. Absolutely. I mean, it was kind of like going from World War II to Vietnam, uh, where uh, the you didn't feel like you were fighting the good fight. Um, you were eliminating a, a impediment to manifest destiny. And, uh, you know, even someone without much of a conscience uh, couldn't feel very good about it unless, you know, you're Custer who glorifies everything uh, because I am here. It is, you know, it, he, yeah, he is operating from the 17th century cavalier point of view where, um, you know, my, you know, my presence uh, glorifies this act. Uh, Washita was, uh, a, you know, a terrible, brutal attack on a, a basically a, a friendly village of Cheyenne. And, um, in his portrayal, it was uh, he, he was his small band against this huge group of Indians. Where um, in actuality, it was you know, not quite as as one sided as that, and and really kind of a pointless military campaign. Um, uh, but you know, Custer, with the help of his wife Libby, who was a great writer, uh, would uh, elevate this to you know a story of 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 Western imperial uh, uh, vanguard uh, into the West. And, you know, the other thing was happening was you had, it was post-Civil War. So you had an army that was, um, you know, had to shrink. And so there weren't a lot of um, good postings available. Uh, everybody was reduced in rank. Uh, the, the, uh, it was hard to find people, uh, uh, privates. Uh, and so there was they were relying on a lot of immigrants, German soldiers to fight the West. And so, so you know, kind of almost a mercenary feeling about it. And, um, and so it was, you know, a different kind of, of venture. And yet Custer always, you know, by going out to the Black Hills, he announces the discovery of gold. Once again, he's in the, the media spotlight. And uh, they're talking about him as potential presidential. Uh, possibility. Uh, his his political instincts were terrible. 
Um, it, it, you know, would never have worked. He was always putting his foot in his mouth. Uh, uh, with the ascension of Grant, a Republican, uh, uh, Custer was, you know, uh, who did, did not like Custer. Uh, Custer would, would make that relationship all the worse by uh, uh, accusing uh, uh, Grant's brother Orville of, of malfeasance when it came to the, um, managing the, the Indian reservations. And, you know, and it all would come to a head um, uh, when it came to the, the showdown at the Little Bighorn. Uh, and the, you know, and the centennial of the country, you know, you almost can't make this kind of dramatic, historic um, uh, coincidence up. It's, it's, uh, and Custer was in the middle of a, a true lightning rod. Well, there's a huge disparity between how he portrays the fighting on the plains. I think his book is called My Life on the Plains or something. And the reality, including the seizure of Native American women uh, for rape, which was common, uh, he uh, himself uh, took uh, 18-year-old girl Mona Sita, uh, who he captured and used as a concubine. There's a quote in your book, uh, one of the soldiers saying something about Indians rape uh, easy. Uh, and there was a real uh, savagery uh, to this conflict, the burning of villages and, and this disparity between how it was portrayed and romanticized by Custer and other whites and what was actually happening on the ground that bore little relation to each other. No, it was, it was a tawdry, dirty war uh, that, uh, you know, no one could feel good about. Uh, Custer, you know, did not, uh, you know, here he was, he supposedly idealized his relationship with his wife, Libby. And here he is, you know, um, treating Indian women as, as his concubines. And, you know, on top of it, his brother, Tom, uh, who uh, was awarded two medals of honor during the Civil War, was at his side um, uh, throughout this. And in fact, there, there's uh, historians wonder if Custer himself was actually sterile uh, because of, of uh, gonorrhea, um, you know, uh, uh, earlier in his, his career. And it might have been Tom's uh, uh, you know, child through Montecita, but, you know, it's just, this is just awful stuff. And, um, and, you know, I think it gets at the heart of what's going on with Western expansion. Um, you know, Americans did everything they could to, to, to portray this as a, a God ordained march across the continent in which civilization was being brought to a savage people. And so people like Custer, us, uh, uh, were uh, felt it incumbent upon themselves to put these these horrible acts uh, in as as golden a glow as possible, and you really could not find a better person to take that kind of role than Custer, uh, who uh, you know was great with the press, um, and uh, you know was was good for a quote, uh, particularly if his wife Libby had a chance to uh, <laughs> massage the prose. And so, uh, you know, uh, Custer is fascinating because he personifies so much of America, um, you know, that is horrifying, really. And yet there is that swashbuckling, you know, char charge into the maw of death uh, that Americans of all, and, and pro pe people of all nations have, have you know, the, the myth of the last stand. I mean, it's it's it, it it's a way to portray uh, a a you know an imperial destiny in a in a, a to make make someone like Custer feel portrayed as the victim. I want to talk a little bit about the battle itself. Custer, when he attacked large Indian encampments, and this was huge, was bigger than uh, anything he had ever seen before. Uh, he would take women and children hostage and use them as human shields knowing that warriors would not attack him uh, if he was surrounded by children, the elderly, and women. Uh, and this was very much the tactic that he hoped to employ at the Little Bighorn. You argue in your book that he came very close to succeeding before being wiped out. But just lay out what happened on that day. Yeah, well, uh, Custer uh, was in uh, desperate to make contact. 
interact uh, with uh, the village um, where Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, this is a huge village, uh, 8,000 to 10,000 uh, Native Americans, um, unprecedented. And uh, he had uh, very poor intelligence. He, he knew they were there, but given the, the contours of the hills, you know, couldn't, had no clue as to how many really were there. And uh, he divides his, his forces uh, uh, into three components, basically, uh, which is the last thing you want to do when you are uh, confronting a larger force. Um, and only gradually does he realize how large this force is. And, you know, there's a great mystery around the Battle of Little Bighorn because uh, the, the, the men who died with the Custer obviously uh, could not provide their their side of the story, although there were several Crow scouts um, who were with him pretty close to the end, who who gave uh, various versions, and but um, and basically this was pure Custer, you know, uh, slam into there, uh, 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 divide forces so that I'm going to get most of the glory. And then, whoops, this is a really big village. And, you know, this was not unusual for Custer. He had put himself in these kinds of positions in the past. And always he had somehow been able to get out. Uh, at the Battle of the Washita, it was uh, by, by uh, using uh, women and children as a human shield. Uh, is how he had extracted himself. And that's what he was, it's, there seems to be evidence that's what he was trying to do uh, at, at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But um, because he was divided from the rest of the force, uh, the, the, the uh, Cheyenne and Lakota were able to, to isolate him and wipe out um, everyone in his command before he accomplished that desperate strategy. And so uh, thus ended Custer. Um, uh, for the officers that knew him uh, and survived, it was, you know, once again, classic Custer. And uh, because Custer... Uh, surrounded him with so many family members it would um his two brothers would die with him in what became known as last stand hill along with a a, a brother-in-law um it was a, a, a you know and this it was a family tragedy as as much as a military uh disaster and it was the perfect fodder uh for a for the the myth of the last stand and um, Custer, with the aid of Custer's wife, grieving uh, widow Libby, um, this would be elevated to a, a myth uh, we are still um, uh, trying to uh, deal with today. So before I get into that myth, which is perpetuated and used in many ways to justify imperial expansion beyond U.S. borders, there was a deep animosity between Reno and Benteen, and I wondered if you could talk about that. Either kind of love Custer, uh, and he did surround himself with a lot of sycophants, or you detested him. Uh, and that played a very key part uh, because he had, in the eyes of Benteen and Reno, they were both captains and were leading two of the other battalions that had split off of Custer. They didn't rush to his assistance uh, because they didn't believe he was in trouble. They didn't trust him. Um, and also uh, because of an anger uh, over the abandonment in their eyes of another officer uh, and their men who were killed, I believe, at the Washita. Yeah, I mean, it, this was a deeply dysfunctional uh, regiment. Uh, Custer despised, you know, his his two underlings, uh, and uh, it was, uh, and even before the battle. Uh, Custer is a talking smack in the press when it comes to Major Reno. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's is purposefully isolating him, mocking him among his, his own coterie. And then you have Ben Teen, who is uh, uh, right out of Shakespeare, um, you know, someone who's sardonic, um, quite talented, and yet, um, you know, uh, and has who has been with Custer for a, a while um, and knows his tricks. And uh, when it comes to that, that, you know, the final chance where maybe he could have gone to Custer's aid, he's in no rush. And, um, and he, he's actually convinced that Custer has left them uh, to what is becomes almost the second last stand when Reno's and uh, Benteen's forces 
combine and are under siege by a huge native force for several days until finally General Terry uh, and uh, is is able to relieve them. And and they're under the impression that that Custer's cut out and and left them. Uh, uh, and when Ben Keen is finally, you know, uh, when they come to Ben Keen, he's he, you know, he he came. Oh, Custer, Custer can't be dead. He's over on the on the, you know watering his horses somewhere. But no, Custer was dead. And um, yeah, it's truly Shakespearean. And it was a disaster largely of Custer's making in terms of uh, what he had done to um, alienate um, his, his, own, his own officers. And, um, and yet, um, you know, it, 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 it just given the, the, the scale of it, uh, the timing of it, you know, this is 1776, just as the nation is about to open the, um, the, the fair to celebrate its its hundredth anniversary. There's a presidential election about to happen, and there's even some people mentioning Custer as a possibility, uh, whether or not that would have actually been the case. But hey, if he had been returned as the hero he expected to be, who knows? Um, and so you have all of this combining, and it's also you have this even before it's over. You have his officers knowing. This is this is history, and um, and they're beginning to 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 um, control the narrative uh, even while the battle is unfolding, and so here we are left today, um, you know, with a significant number of the force uh, uh, wiped out, and the others at a distance. Um, uh, telling their side of the story, and uh, it is it's you know it's because there's a mystery at the heart of it. Um, yeah, it will, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, a battle that will resonate uh, for as long as we are a, a nation, I think. Well, to be fair to Reno, Custer was pretty much of a disaster. But as you write, most of the time Reno was drunk, so he hardly knows where he is. Uh, but for the intervention of Benteen, Reno's force would probably have been wiped out. Uh, all Reno wanted to do was run away as fast as he could. Uh, Custer instantly became a martyr after he was killed to the American Empire and in popular mythology. Uh, supposedly, he was the last to die in battle. There's no proof of that. Uh, and you even write about the possibility that he was severely wounded uh, even before they got to Last Stand Hill, where the remnants were wiped out. We don't know. Uh, and that he was betrayed by Reno and Benteen. This became, again, popular mythology who were later branded as cowards because they didn't come to his rescue. Custer becomes the epitome of the American hero. He's held up as the model of the American empires. The country moves from subjugating Native Americans to subjugating other Native populations overseas. Uh, the language that the military used and still uses uh, today to speak about conflicts, this was true in Vietnam, or Iraq, where they refer to uh, hostile areas as Indian country. It hasn't changed. Uh, can you speak about how this moment in history has replicated itself in American culture? Yeah. Well, you know, we after World War II um, and and Korea, uh, we move into this, you know, this this era, which is eerily. Uh, like uh, the wars, uh, the, the Tadri wars fought uh, as we as the country marched west, and it's you know it, it's it's the same tactic still being used where you try to infiltrate um, the, you know the other side. You 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 find um, some a soldier there and and turn them and use them to to get at the others. It's you know it's 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 an amazing uh, similarity and and you know and look what has happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. That same sense of betrayal of of uh, you know a uh, complete needless uh, you know, the, 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 in the American West, these were forces that were unfolding. They could have unfolded gradually and much more humanely. Um, but, um, you know, the Indian Wars made sure that it, it would uh, uh, be a very different story. And, and you know, it's it, for me as an American, it, it makes me wonder, you know, how much of this is the, Amer the American psyche, um, you know, how... Um, several hundred years of our history uh, con of conquest within our own continent 
uh, at least as, as we perceived it, how much of that um, schooled us uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in how we approach uh, the world, uh, you know, after that, you know, at, particularly because you, you have World War I and World War II where we can say we were legitimately helping European forces of, of good. Uh, but before that, you have our, our you know, the Spanish wars in the Philippines and Cuba, and then you have it on the other side, uh, Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan. And you, you just you, you see the, the military having once again um, uh, to use their, you know, to, to make the ultimate sacrifice for a cause that is very hard to, to, to um, justify. And, um, and, you know, how much of that is who we are, how much of that is the human nature <laughs> of, of, you know, we, as the world becomes the battlefield, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, but I think you can look to the Battle of Lig Bighorn in many ways. It wasn't the first battle by any means, but it created kind of a, 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 a mythic template that seems to get uh, uh, revisited over and over again. Well, the power of your book is that it captures the DNA of American society. Canada approached this in a very different way. Uh, many historians argue there was no need to attack the Native Americans because with the decimation of the buffalo herds and the seizure of the waterways, uh, which is what the settlers first took, Native Americans who were nomadic couldn't sustain themselves anyway. That was Nathaniel Philbrick, author of The Last Stand, Custer, Sitting Bull, and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. <laughs> <laughs>